Hello folks, welcome to Cross Examination TV. I'm your host, Charles Peterson. And today, we'll be continuing in the prophecy series in the book of Revelation chapter one. This is a verse by verse exposition and commentary in one of the most relevant books in the Bible concerning Bible prophecy. Not only is the book full of apocalyptic language and visions, it's also chock full of foundational doctrines and principles for Christian living. Most people shy away from the book because of its prophetic language and symbolism. But the book promises in the first chapter a blessing to all who read the Revelation. I don't know about you, but I can use all the blessings I can get. Stay tuned as we once again dive into the book of Revelation and mine out the gems of its message on today's episode of Cross Examination. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. I want to start by dividing this verse 10 into two parts, in which we can deal with two foundational doctrines the Christian faith. In the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard a great voice as of a trumpet. There's been a lot of teaching in denominations that say the Holy Spirit doesn't indwell the believer when he's saved. I guess a better representation of the belief is that not all of the Holy Spirit indwells the believer when he's saved. That's what some believe. We need to ask ourselves a few questions to sort this thing out. What does the Bible say about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Does God only give part of the Holy Spirit when one is saved and give the other half only when one prays and tarries for it? There are a lot of advertisements that promise you the world, but they only deliver up some of the world's dirt. They promise you the moon and the stars, but when you take them up on their offer, you only get part of the star and the rest costs you way more than the advertised price. Is God such an advertiser? Is God a rogue marketer? Does Jesus promise only part of the Holy Spirit to the new believer and give the rest only to those who work to get it? These are valid questions to ask concerning the Holy Spirit. We can begin to answer these and solve this issue with some basic Bible truth. Let's go to the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. How plain and simple Paul the Apostle settles the issue here in the book of Romans. Notice, the Spirit is capitalized in this passage, meaning it's a reference to the Holy Spirit Himself. Paul says simply here that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you don't belong to Christ. Jesus told the disciples before His death, burial, and resurrection that He would send them another comforter. John 14, 16, and 17. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter 
that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Notice that Jesus promised the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost would dwell within the believer. Now I want you to understand that when you get saved, you get all of the Holy Ghost. The very minute you're saved from hell and what the Bible calls the second death, meaning eternal separation from God in the lake of fire that was made for the devil and his angels. There's not one portion of the Holy Ghost that you do not receive. The very same moment your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life according to the Scriptures. So don't worry about being filled with the Spirit and having to tarry long hours in anguish, in desperation, just to be filled with the Spirit to speak in tongues. If you're saved, God has given you all of His Spirit. So what does it mean to be in the Spirit? As John the Revelator mentioned, he was on the Lord's Day in our passage. In the summer of 1872 near Dublin, Ireland, an all-night prayer meeting had just concluded when British evangelist Henry Varley says, The world has yet to see what God can do with and through a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. Another man attending the meeting quotes in his diary, I want to be that man. That man was none other than Dwight L. Moody. D. L. Moody was one of the greatest American evangelists of all time. He was also publisher and he founded the Moody Church, Northfield School, and Mount Hermon School in Massachusetts, and also the Moody Bible Institute and Moody Publishers. His sermons and quotes are read in pulpits the world over, even today. His influence on Christianity is far-reaching. I would have to say that D.L. Moody became that man who was wholly consecrated unto God. What was his key to success? Moody's key and ours, for that matter, is walking in the Spirit. Let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit that authored the Bible in its entirety through almost 40 human writers over approximately 1,500 years commands us to be filled with the Spirit. Notice again, Spirit is capitalized in our passage, indicating that it is the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. This is the will of the Lord, to be filled with the Spirit. Now if you get all the Spirit when you're saved, what's this passage talking about? I can tell you very plainly. Notice the passage warns not to be drunk with wine, or any other beverage for that matter, but to be filled with the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit of God. You're filled with what you put in your body. There are many avenues to fill your body. You can ingest things through your mouth and other orifices for that matter. You can take in drugs and medicine through needles into your veins, drops in your eyes, etc. You can also fill up your mind with images from the internet, books that you read, programs that you watch, to fill yourself with the things of God is to be filled with the Spirit. To be in the Spirit as John the Revelator was on the Lord's Day in this passage meant that he was prayed up, paid up, read up, and fully filled 
with the Word of God. He was in full communion, spiritually in prayer, as he waited in the presence of God for God to speak to him. And man, oh man, did God ever speak to him. What does being in the Spirit look like to the world? Let me give you an, an example. How many football games have you watched and the camera pans to the crazy guy with makeup all over his face? He's got an outfit on that fully represents the team he's there supporting, yelling at the top of his lungs. That guy's the guy who's in the spirit of his favorite team at that particular moment. All of his being and effort have been given to look like, to sound like, and to be like someone who knows exactly where he stands on this particular day of battle on the football field. This guy has expended all efforts to show support and is filled with his team's spirit. The Christian who's filled with the spirit is one who has spent all effort to seek out the Word of God, to understand the Word of God. He may have even fasted from food and drink and afflicted his body with hunger in order to be closer to God. This Christian is 100% sold out to God, not just for show, but for real and intimate fellowship with the God of heaven. He's emptied himself of his selfish ambitions and desires God's will and purpose above all things to be accomplished in his life. This is where John the Revelator was at on the Lord's Day when he was given the revelation of Jesus Christ that became the book we're now studying. Being filled with the Spirit means emptying yourself completely, having your whole being full of the things of God. Having the mind of Christ comes with knowing and following the Word of God as revealed in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12:13 says that by one spirit we are all baptized into one body and we've all been made to drink of one spirit. This is a life that we should strive to live. A life filled with the Spirit of God. The life lived filled with the Spirit of God is a life that's fruitful and blessed. Galatians 5.16 this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. I'm reminded of an American Indian story describing the battle that rages inside us all. It's the story of two wolves, and it's told like this. One evening, an old Cherokee told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside us all. One is evil. It is anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The other is good. It's joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf wins? The old Cherokee simply replied, the one that you feed. This is a good illustration of the battle that rages inside of man. Our battle is not between wolves, but between the flesh and the spirit. Each seek after the things that cause them to grow in strength and influence in our lives. 
the battles for the soul. The soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. It's that part of us that decides and guides our thoughts and actions and governs our entire way of life. The flesh craves comfort, pleasure, self-indulgence, power, and influence. The spirit wishes to influence us to be patient, to be kind, long-suffering, slow to anger, peaceable above all things. The spirit urges us on to selfless sacrifice, in sacrifice of our own wants and desires, for the good of others. Paul the Apostle wrote almost two-thirds of the New Testament under the unction and authorship of the Holy Spirit. He was most certainly a man of God who walked according to the Spirit. He was beaten to the brink of death, shipwrecked, imprisoned, and treated as an evil doer on several occasions. All for simply preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would say that if there was ever such a man that was spiritual, Paul the Apostle would definitely fit the bill. But Paul himself spoke of a similar struggle between the spirit and the flesh in the book of Romans. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that, when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Folks, all Christians are simply sinners, saved by grace. But even after being filled with the Spirit, and reborn as a child of God, this side of eternity, we sin because we're sinners by nature. Our natural bodies were born in sin, and until we expire, or we are changed into our glorified bodies at the rapture, we are subject to our fleshly desires. As we become more mature in Christ, we put off more of the sin nature but we will never be completely free of sin's grasp until we see Jesus. Then, in an instant, mortality will put on immortality and the corruptible will put on incorruption. Only then will the battle raging within our bodies be won. The second part of Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 says that John heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Right here John the Revelator encounters none other than Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, speaking to him with authority. This phrase, as of a trumpet, gives urgency to the message that Jesus had for John. When Jesus spoke to the disciples, he never sounded like a trumpet. And he's the same today, tomorrow, and forever. So why would his voice sound any different than it did to them while he was on earth? Jesus was communicating to John that his message required swift and decisive action. The trumpet symbolized a clarion call to action on the part of John the Apostle. He was to take heed and write what he saw and what he heard. A trumpet gives off a certain sound. It's loud and distinct. The Israelites used the silver trumpets to alert the people of danger and impending battles. They were also sounded to let the Israelites know 
when it was time to journey on and follow the cloud. Sometimes that occurred during the night. So they would have been awakened by the sound of the silver trumpets. At the last trump, we shall be raised incorruptible in Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Also, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, Jesus returns with a shout, the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, to gather us together in the sky during the event known as the rapture. The trumpet's a call to action, to battle, to victory in Christ when He calls us home to be with Him forever. Do you live for the sound of the trumpet? Are you ready for departure if He came today? If not, now's the time to settle your account with God by accepting by faith Jesus Christ in His perfect atonement for the sin in your life. Revelation 1, 11. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Alpha and Omega is defined in the verse as the first and the last. Who's first? Was Jesus first? This is an important topic to discuss because it defines where you stand when it comes to Christ. We can all agree that only the eternal God of heaven can proclaim with such authority as being the first and the last. Only the Creator Himself can hold this title, and there's no God but the one true God of heaven, Jehovah. Is it God? Is it Jesus? The answer is yes. It is God and it is Jesus. Because Jesus and God are one and the same. To most, that's a preposterous claim. Most will agree that Jesus was a good man who made his mark on history. Others will even agree that Jesus was a prophet. And yet a smaller number will proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. The year of his birth is so prominent that the majority of the world recognizes it on the timeline with the letters BC, which means before Christ. Who else but God has the power to split time in two? Sadly, few recognize Jesus as the creator of the universe, the first and the last, he who was, is, and is to come. Go to the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now some people will tell you that the King James Version of the Bible has a bad translation of this passage. Then they'll try and persuade you to believe that verse 1 should read, and the word was a God. The problem with this theory and supposition is simply that the original Greek text does not contain or infer the indefinite article. To put it plainly, the plain sense of the King James Version is accurate and makes so much sense that we should seek no other sense. Jesus has many names, one of them being the Word, which I want to point out is capitalized in our passage. The capitalization indicates that it is a reference to God. As we progress through the passage, we see that the same Jesus was with God in the beginning, and the same God made all things. Now if Jesus and God were two different beings, why are they so intertwined? In these passages. Let's explore this topic just a bit further in Colossians 1, 14 through 18. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, 
whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Jesus shed his blood on Calvary's cross that we may have forgiveness of sins. He's the image of God, the firstborn. By him were all things created. He's also the head of the body, the church. You can't separate the Father from the Son or the Holy Spirit. These three are one, according to John 5, 7. It's one God expressed in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When God said, let us make man in our image in Genesis 1.26, he wasn't talking to himself. He was addressing the others with him on the throne. He was talking to the Son of God and the Holy Spirit, which is also a person of the Godhead. All three were active and involved in the creation. This is the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, which so many have attacked because it's difficult to understand. I can't explain it really or fully comprehend how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one and the same, but I can believe the Bible when it says that it's so. Truth is truth, and this truth is simply the foundational principle of the Christian faith. Jesus was God, He is God, and he will always be God, no matter how many deny this truth. The truth still remains. Jesus was crucified for this very reason. As he proclaimed himself to be God, and the religious folks of his day cried blasphemy. Pontius Pilate asked Jesus if he was the king of the Jews, and Jesus replied, It is as you say. Jesus didn't deny his divinity although he resisted using his divine power to spare himself the agony of the cross. Jesus is King of kings, Lord of lords. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. All the earth shall declare his majesty to him, be the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, folks, that's our show for today. I hope it's been a blessing to you. If this show has been a blessing to you, will you let me know by sending me a letter to Cross Examination TV? It's P.O. Box 17441, Tucson, Arizona, 85731. Would you like to get involved in taking the gospel to the world? Go to crossexaminationtv.org and click on the link, Partner With Me. To find out how you can help this ministry launch programming on worldwide satellite television. The fields are ripe and modern day technology has made it possible for individuals to reach the world with the gospel. Will you help me in the Great Commission to take the gospel into all the world? Many hands make light work, so please Consider taking your part in this great endeavor to reach the world for the sake of the gospel. Thanks for watching Cross Examination TV. Until we meet again, keep looking up, for our redemption draweth nigh.